was very excited about working on a science fiction film with Chris, knowing what a sci-fi fan he is, and I knew it would be really something remarkable and special. This world's a treasure. It's been telling us to leave for a while now. Your daughter's generation will be the last to survive on Earth. For a sound editor, working with Chris is fantastic because he he has impeccable taste and he knows what he wants. He's constantly challenging you to push beyond what you think you can do. And good enough is never, <laughs> is never good enough. So we did a certain amount of recording in the summer and fall to get a head start on what I knew would be a larger sound effects recording job and began thinking about how some of those concepts and ideas could be revealed using sound. What we tried to do was stage some of the set pieces and sequences that were in the film in a very low budget manner, just for the sound purposes. So the corn scene, some of the dust storm material, it's a building block situation. You know, what I did was, I started with the easy stuff. I started with the terrestrial material. The farmhouse where Cooper and his family live is in the middle of a huge cornfield, hundreds of acres of corn. There's a sequence early in the film when they have to set out across the cornfield at high speed in the truck. They're chasing something with a truck. So we found a cornfield and were able for a small fee to mow that down with a pickup truck that we rigged with a metal bumper as kind of a corn catcher and mounted mics behind that and inside the truck. And we just drove repeatedly through the cornfield. We only had about a, maybe a five second run through the corn. Well, one of our brilliant sound effects recordists, John Fasal, created a sand gun, and he experimented with it, felt the intensity was strong enough. We got an old junk truck and spent a day blowing gravel and debris and sand at it. And those combined and lined up with the winds it just gives you that feeling. And then Greg Landecker did some beautiful work really maximizing the sounds and really you know, moving them a bit and uh, giving the buffets a little extra hit. We basically just went with the production track. Chris really wanted to strip it down, make it very simple. And in order to create that track without any looping, which we did very little of, literally a handful of lines, six lines, eight lines, Hugo Wang and Bob Kaiser did a huge amount of work cutting production dialogue like sound effects and fitting it in putting in syllables here and there where we could articulate a word a little better. And that was an ongoing process. And they did a phenomenal job, a huge amount of work. It's inarguably sticks to the screen and that's what Chris likes about it. It is just inarguably there. The scene begins with Cooper leaving his house for the last time and cut to the rocket launch and it's meant to be like a new chapter. And it needed to be you. We obviously used a lot of rocket recordings, some rocket motor tests that we recorded out of Mojave here, as well as a number of recordings of rocket engines in general. Just looking at these sequences, it's, it's clear that it has to be about as intense as it can get without the ship coming apart. And since we're not hearing any sounds in space when they're in these precarious situations, we only hear, one, its effect on the ship, and two, whatever sound it might activate in the atmosphere inside the ship. So there are two kind of two components to that. One is that sound that is activated in the atmosphere inside the ship by whatever gravity or whatever forces are being exerted upon the ship. And the other is the, is the movement, and it really had to feel like you're in a car with no suspension hitting a speed bump at 80 miles an hour, and it's gonna really rattle your teeth. It's gonna, it's gonna knock you back. So it, it's that kind of just hanging on for dear life feeling that we wanted to achieve. We started out recording big stuff, planes out at the aircraft boneyard and 
picked up a wing with a forklift and dropped it and and that was good but it didn't have a whole lot of character so we needed a lot of little rattles which Ken Johnson did weeks of recording and experimenting with just vibrating a table full of metal debris. On our trip to the aircraft to Boneyard, we set up a couple of big PA speakers and subwoofers in one of the fuselages. And we had two oscillators connected to the two sets of speakers and subwoofers, and we just played around with sine waves and putting them in phase with each other and slightly taking them out of phase with each other, cranking them down way below audible level 15 hertz and then slowly bringing them up to where the plane started to shake. That was really the only synthesized sound that we used in the film was the, the rumble and the shakes or for particularly dramatic light flashes that occurred in the wormhole. The sound of space is revealed at the end of this launch sequence and it's suddenly very silent, very oddly silent. And Chris uh, made a call early on to not use any hums or drones or you know, equipment sounds in the background, no bleeps or bloops. He didn't want it to feel like a Hollywood science fiction movie. He liked the idea of, well, this is their office. This is their place they're going to live for years. So the sound that we hear in the ships is the room tone they recorded on the set. They're on ice. It may not be the same kind of ice we have on Earth. It's got more ammonia in it. But John Rush, one of our Foley artists, got some huge blocks of ice. We did a lot of crampon scratching on the ice and moving on the ice. And as far as Foley in general, recording all the robot's footsteps, we made a shoe, essentially, a metal shoe that he put on and was able to walk the robot to, to picture. As far as what I hope the audience thinks of the sound, I would hope that they think that the sound was all shot on the days that they shot the movie and that it's all there. It's much more satisfying to really think you nailed it and, and put them in that spaceship and for them to just accept that this is reality. You want to experience a film as a, any other work of art. It's an emotional and physical ride.